Hello and welcome again. This is the fifth installment of the Nausicast where we go through every Ghibli film in chronological order with discussions and analysis that is hopefully worthy of them. And today we return once more to a film by director Hayao Miyazaki. With me today are a few familiar voices. We have Miki. Hi, I'm Miki. We have Roggle. Hello, I'm Roggle. Hipster Kusulu. Uh, I couldn't think of a witch pun in time, but uh, I'm here. And of course, me, Nerd. So let's get to the film, Kiki's Delivery Service. First of all, the film released in 1989 was actually after we've had like a, a, a what's it called? A, a dearth, a dearth of like financial success in, in Studio Ghibli. This movie was a financial success. Finally, the highest grossing film in Japan in 1989. And that's very interesting, but probably helped by the fact that it's based on and a novel, a novel by Eiko Cardono of the same name, Kiki's Delivery Service, popular with young uh, women, I guess, and girls. Um, the film itself deviates a bit from its source material by being a bit, uh, or the other way around, the novel is a bit more episodic, consisting mainly of small stories about various like people that Kiki meets and incidents and encounters that happens while she's making her deliveries. The film, I think, in a sense, retains some of that structure, but there's like no dramatic finale, no traumatic events, no uh, blimp crashing into uh, into the clock tower in in the book at all. In, mostly, Kiki just overcomes like the small encounters and challenges uh, based on her good heart and her ever expanding circle of friends. Yeah, I believe the most substantial change made from the book to the film is that uh, Ursula. Uh, is made like a, a full character. From what I read, I didn't actually get to read the book in time, but from what I saw, she was only like a small part of someone Kiki meets once, but in this she takes on like a much more important role. She's like a big sister character to Kiki, a big part of her whole discovering her magic again in the, the latter half of the film. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think there there's uh, an angle to what Kiki's going through that that Miyazaki uses Ursula to shed some light on. And I think, um, I mean, more importantly, I mean, as Nyard mentioned, that the whole blimp uh, episode, I'm going to call it an episode, uh, doesn't happen in the books. So that is entirely added by Miyazaki. Yeah. And in fact, there was a bit of a disagreement based on the changes made. Cardono was actually unhappy. And uh, during the screenplay stage, the film was shot from being cancelled. Uh, actually, Miyazaki and Toshio Suzuki, uh, the producer of Ghibli, had to uh, visit her and invite her to Studio Ghibli to convince her. And apparently, this is at least the anecdote I've read, is that Miyazaki brought in a female Ghibli staff member to persuade uh, uh, Cardono that a film narrative needs a different kind of story from a book. That's a <laughs> an interesting thing. Yeah, I think pretty interestingly is, um, from everything I've seen, this film had quite a, a very turbulent production in which originally it had other directors attached to it and they dropped out, so Miyazaki was kind of like forced to take up the reins of it um, somewhat into the project. And originally it was being discussed that it might be a um, a delivery, they might do a cross promotion with a delivery service and the delivery service people were like pushing for more and more of their like product in the film to like like kind of tarnish it and so Miyazaki completely cut ties with that and it yeah. really endangered the film's production. So yeah, there there was some stuff about that. Because Miyazaki at first chose Sunao Katabuchi as the director, um, whom he had worked on uh, with on Sherlock Hound. And Kiki's delivery service would have been his uh, directorial debut. It didn't end up happening, obviously. But uh, about Katabuchi, he later went on to direct, uh, among other things, the films Are Tahima and In This Corner of the World, as well as the series Black Lagoon that some of you might be familiar with. <laughs> uh, interesting how that relates. So um, since, and then another person that was hired onto the project and ultimately canned was uh, Nobuyuki Ishiki as a script writer. And Miyazaki was dissatisfied with the original uh, script and uh, like, then did his own one. This is, by the way, also how he came onto the project because he was just like kind of supervising it. 
But because he was so bothered by every element of what the other people did, he just kind of gradually replaced them. There was no point where he said, like, I hated your work, you're fired. But instead, he just at some point announced, well, I've done so much already. I think I'm just going to take over the seat of director. <laughs> it's a very typical Miyazaki uh, kind of anecdote, I guess. Yeah, very yeah, much so. Perfectionism is always there. Yeah, he, he, he started off taking like a backseat and then he just slowly, slowly takes over the project because nobody can do it like him, damn it. Yeah, I believe there was also a lot of um, criticism of Miyazaki where, yeah, Totoro and um, Laputa both didn't bring like as much into the box office as was expected or was wanted. And so a lot of people were questioning Miyazaki's ability to make like a hit film that would actually make a good deal of money for the studio. And in fact, I believe Miyazaki himself was considering sh shutting down the studio after Totoro's production because he was like he didn't like the way that the staff would get into too many like conflicts and stuff and wanted to um just refresh all the people there to have a like a better kind of creative creative atmosphere but he got talked out of that and they kind of changed the studio in other ways after kiki's production yeah we can be glad that kiki turned out to be a financial success to take some of those struggles away from the studio because it would be a shame if they weren't around to make their uh, upcoming best movies um yeah uh this habit of Miyazaki, Susan Napier calls a desire for aesthetic control and an almost masochistic perfectionism. I think that's quite fitting because we can see the masochism in that old man who like announces retirement like five to six times or whatever and always coming back to manually like redraw individual frames and so on, all these famous Miyazaki anecdotes. It's really again showing through in this uh, uh, anecdote. So about the sponsorship thing you brought up, Actually, that is still there and partially informing the title because Yamato Transport have been one of the main sponsors for the film. And the word of the of the original Japanese title, which is uh, uh, Takyubin, the word, is literally like a brand related to that transport service. Um and only has been like come to colloquial use as a synonym to home delivery mail through use. Like I don't know, like the, the, the kinds of brands that turn into a synonym for like the entire thing they represent, you know, that, that yeah, kind of like stuff. Hoover's. Yeah. Yeah. Kleenex, stuff like that. Exactly. And yeah, the, the company approved of using this, this, this name and so on and so on. But also in reverse, the company today still has on its logo a little mascot character, which is a black cat in reference to uh, Gigi and Kiki. <laughs> So, and while we're on some interesting production details, I have one more that, that struck me as particularly interesting, which is that in the Disney dub, the character of Gigi was changed substantially. Not only did they get like a, a male voice actor, comedian or whatever to, to, to dub him. I actually didn't write down the name. I have a fucking... Uh, uh, does Phil Hartman ring a bell? Yeah, that's, that's the name. Yeah. Uh, so that Phil that, Hartman is I the think... um, voice of Ned Flanders, I believe. Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's Gigi in the in the English dub, and uh, that changed also uh, Gigi's personality, adding way more voice lines, uh, including ad libs with a lot of cynical commentary that wouldn't be around in, in the Japanese Kiki at all, and. The Disney dub, interestingly enough, also changes the ending because by the ending, it is implied that Kiki can talk to Gigi again, which is really a, a really big deviation if we look at it from a thematic standpoint. Yeah, uh, I, not I noticed that change quite well because while I do prefer uh, Phil Hartman in his performance in general, and I found it confusing that they went with a female Seiyu, even though Gigi is clearly a male and we see him have kids. That was a bit of a confusing choice. Yeah, the ending where Gigi still can't talk to Kiki is actually like quite a thematically important thing that Miyazaki, I think maybe in starting point, he mentions that, that he, he really liked that as a choice about how even though Kiki made mistakes, she fixed some of them and some of them are still permanent and she just has to like go on with those uh, things missing from her life. So I think Disney made quite like a radical shift there in the tone of the ending. But luckily for the DVD re-release of this dub, they actually removed most of the ad-libs and changed the ending back to its original kind of version. 
So, yeah, <laughs> I guess all's well that ends well. So, originally, and luckily, we have such an amazing source available for us to go through background information. We can look at Starting Point, Miyazaki's book, where some of the text and essays are collected, including the project, project notes and the pitch for Kiki. I think that's a very good starting point to kind of see what Miyazaki was thinking when he created the movie and what he intended to do with it. And he kind of clearly expresses that Kiki for him is a movie about the spirit and hopes of young girls, his words, and discovering and expressing one's own talents. And yeah, um, he mentioned that um, he compares this and one of the inspirations for, for choosing Kiki was seeing young female animators coming to cities and coming to Studio Ghibli and trying to work as manga, manga artists or as animators and so on and so on. And he was very inspired by this. Yeah, the very clear theme through a lot of Kiki is that her skill at flying and being a witch is um, measured to that of an artist, as we clearly see with Ur Ursula, who's almost like a grown-up version of Kiki, or, or in a way a more realistic version, because she paints and that's her talent and that's her form of magic. And they like both compare their um, motivation for doing such things. So the uh, the artist reading of the film with Kiki being uh, an animator is uh, very well deserved. Fun fact, Kiki and Ursula in the original Japanese dub have the same voice actress. Yeah, yeah, I remember hearing that. I didn't quite pick it out, so that's a testament to how good she is. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, same, but it, it lends a lot of credence to your uh, thesis that Ursula is just an a, a adult Kiki. Um, I found a quote in the design document or project notes on uh, Kiki in Starting Point quite nice, which I want to read, which is, when we initially encountered... Oh, wait, I wrote it down wrong. When we initially encountered Kiki in Eiko Kakuno's story... The image that first came to mind was that of a young girl flying through the night sky over a city. There would be lots of sparkling lights below, but these lights would not warmly welcome her. And that's a very interesting phrase. Like, we always associate, like, the warm sparkling lights, of course, with, like, welcoming, warmth, community, place that is home. But in this journey of independence, what Kiki finds originally is... A, f a place quite foreign to her, right? These moments where she first enters the city and talks to the people, but they're kind of like puzzled, like, uh, we're glad you're here, but what? <laughs> yeah, she has to, she has to find uh, what she can contribute. She has to make her own uh, space to become a part of this uh, new society she finds herself in. I, th I think a big part of that is that um, th the film is all about her expectations versus the reality of what she is, she's she's having to go through. So Kiki's expectations of this new city is that everyone will be happy and friendly and be pleased to see her because they don't have a witch. And she assumes that all cities that don't have witches must want a witch and therefore she'll be welcomed with open, up, open arms. But uh, the reality is that the people there, they're doing just fine without her and they don't necessarily need her in the way that she's expecting and so she kind of has to carve out this own her own space rather than have people just have a space ready and welcome for her to fit into so she has to actively create the place where she needs to exist rather than have that place just give to her this is also an interesting deviation because Miyazaki uh directly highlighted that this girl is not a princess because he previously had a lot of princesses but this girl is not a princess. She is an, a normal person. She is a regular girl. She is, despite being a witch, not particularly like outlandish or crazy or magical or overwhelming, but in fact, meek and has her own worries and shortcomings and anxieties. And she's just very grounded. Yeah. Unlike the other witches we see who kind of already have their own niche, their own specialty, their own... Um sort of unique skills like uh we see kiki's mother um and she's always making cures she's always making potions and then we see um the older witch i don't i don't remember if she has a name uh 
She doesn't, does she? No, I don't she's know. not named. I don't she's think she just, was introduced. She, yeah, she just appears for that one scene, so she didn't get her. Okay. Yeah, and her thing is is giving, uh, is delivering fortunes, is, is telling the future. So um, each of them already has their own thing, whereas with Kiki, she's just trying to discover... Uh, I mean, she's out to figure out what she wants to do with herself, what she wants to do with her magic. Um, yeah, and that's important to highlight because she wants to figure out what to do with her magic and what magic means, all these kinds of implications that thematically are, are going through in the movie, like talent or your place or the, your passion, what you want to do in your future and so on and so on. Miyazaki wanted to avoid that this movie becomes simply a career success story. He said this explicitly. It's not about going to the city and being a business owner, an entrepreneur, but it's about finding a place in a community and, and, and relating to your own talents. Yeah, I do. I did notice just uh, looking at it now, the way that uh, Kiki's flying is presented is pretty interesting in the way that amongst the witches we see, uh, flying is the most basic of skills and Kiki doesn't even give it a second thought. She just thinks flying is all she can do. But then we see uh, our character Tombo, who's obsessed with flying, and we can see he spent his entire life trying to get up in the air of his own means, and he like loves the dirigible that's in town. And so we kind of see how something that Kiki takes for granted as her like talent, as like this insanely unbelievable magical ability, but she finds it whatever. She doesn't care of it as a talent or notice it as something special. But to Tombo, it's like the whole world, and it's like what makes him fall in love with her. Yeah, it's interesting how that is. Miyazaki compared this in an interview to how animators sometimes can also forget how to animate. Like, this is a skill in your profession, in your artistic endeavors you take for granted, but you notice it only when it really disappears and you're like, holy shit, how did I, how did I do this again? How did this work again? Like, he related very explicitly to, to that kind of struggle of losing the... The, the flight that has, has been taken for granted so far. Yeah, I think it also just carries a nice message about um, what people imagine their skill set is and not realizing that they might already have talents and skills that like uh, are great to other people and they just need to kind of find a setting that really allows them to understand that. And the city, in a way that like it brings a lot of young women to it, doing all these different jobs, it brings Kiki to it and she realizes flying is the one thing she has. Before we go on to the larger thematic implications of this, I would want to like talk about writing an art with you. Like, obviously the structure is interesting. The structure is weird. Uh, it, it goes through almost anecdotal, almost episodic, like we would expect in the novel, uh, deliveries one after the other until suddenly everything breaks down. And so suddenly Kiki loses her ability to fly. And then, uh, and I have to say this, like, the first time I was really, the first time I watched this movie, I was really confused by the ending of why is there this dramatic scene with the blimp? Why is Tombo like stuck in a very almost melodramatic scene on that uh, uh, flying device and being roped through the entire city? Uh, other than just to be a dramatic uh, finale to Kiki's loss of her magic. And... Uh, on a, on a second viewing, which I did for this podcast, I've, I've put it together, I think. I, I, I got it now. I got it now where it belongs. But, it, but it's in a very interesting position because I feel like this is where it kind of breaks with conventional structure. Mm, I, I, I think the, the central structural element of Kiki's delivery service is, is Kiki herself and her development as, as, uh, as she sort of... Uh, seeks to figure out what she wants to do with herself um, and to find her place in this society. Um, so like kind of her own internal strugg struggles and growth become the uh, structural meat of the film as opposed to a more uh, traditional sequence of a, um, like a more traditional like plot with like a clear... Um, fantasy plot at least because like Cute. this is like yeah as as a movie like I, I wouldn't i don't really think of this as like a a um as like a big fantasy like set piece type thing but rather it's more of um 
I fucking hate that I'm using this term. I fucking hate this. But uh, slice of life is really how I would describe it. You know, it's a valid enough term that's describing a very specific like cultural niche. Uh, I don't know if it's a slice of life as it is more of a classic. Um, what's the Bill's Dunk Bill's Roman? Roman. Bill's, Bill's Roman. Roman. Yeah, some German word, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's clearly about her maturing, but uh, not just a, a straight maturity where she just becomes an adult and it's over. It's like she she clearly grows up. She leaves home in the beginning of the movie and starts her business, and that's kind of the first stage. And then it's her being accepted within the society and understanding that like being mature isn't just being a grown-up person living on your own, but it's learning to live with other people. That's like a true level of maturity, and that's kind of where the film... Uh, comes from because she initially rejects Tombo's friends as these others and she's very uncomfortable around people her own age and after that she has to kind of rescue Tombo and rework that relationship as we see in the end credits so that's like a another stage of maturity she gets through I think to to expand on that um one of the other things that Miyazaki talked about in starting point is he there's this whole section in the interview called the foolish things of youth where Miyazaki talks about how he does he 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 is very stubborn as a person and so he can project and empathize with these characters who do these foolish things that don't make any rational sense but they do it because like they 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 find it un, unable they find themselves unable to reconcile themselves with other people and the world around them so for the example Miyazaki uses, he, w he would go down uh, a wrong street and end up nowhere near his destination rather than ask for help. And and it's a very prideful thing. And he, 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 he puts a lot of that into Kiki. And he says that, like, he, he finds this about himself very embarrassing and quite shameful. But this is one of the few times where he's allowed himself to be vulnerable about this kind of thing by showing that he, he himself is... He, he can be stubborn, he can be foolish, he can be stupid, and showing this on film uh, allows other people to relate and say, yeah, I'm foolish and stupid and I make wrong decisions and I fail and do all sorts of things. So I think it's very, it's Miyazaki opening up and allowing himself to be vulnerable uh, in the film and showing that through Kiki and demonstrating that like everyone goes through these kinds of things and like it's it's just part of growing up is to be able to accept the things that you get wrong and learning to accept help when you need it and not be prideful about these things. Yeah, I think that's why Kiki such like feels like such a well realized character because all of her little interactions and particularly all of her ones with Tombo really reflect a, a, an immaturity and a childish kind of psychology, but it all comes off as incredibly believable. Like the way when she first meets him, she kind of ignores him because she thinks. That would be the proper thing to do at the time. And then she ends up clearly caring for him later on uh, against her own against her own uh, idea of what she should be. And then, of course, that scene where she storms off after seeing his friends, it's almost like she was having that moment with him and these people have just intruded, so she's now just kind of angry at everything but could never quite like put it in words herself. Yeah, I completely agree with that. We also get that very cute little moment where uh, she goes to the toilet and then she sees the uh, the baker guy come out and she just hides, embarrassed like yeah. any child would. <laughs> Doesn't want to get caught going to the toilet. That was very uh, relatable um, because these, especially with the toilet, I don't even know why, but you hear someone coming, quickly close the door again, <laughs> wait yeah. till they're gone and then run. Run up there, run up to her room. That's that's re very real. Yeah. But it also represents, like, her initial state about this community. She was kind of alienated from everyone. She was, of course, the outsider just coming in. And basically, in order to feel at home there or be accepted, she first needed to build up connections. And this is what we see her doing throughout the entire movie. And interestingly enough, it's mainly um, uh, it's mainly women that she connects to: the old lady, the uh, uh, the 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 baker for for 
whom she works and where she has her delivery servers. The um, first delivery is a pregnant, uh, not, not a pregnant, a mother with a baby, right, that, that has a delivery. Yeah, I mean, with the exception of, of Tombo, like, interactions yeah. with men are, are kept to, I mean, a minimum. Tombo and, like, the baker are the only men with speaking roles, and the baker is, is, the is baker relegated has, like, one to line. as small a role as possible. Does, yeah. he, does he get any line? I don't think he gets a single line in the Japanese I, I think he, gets he one. does. I, he does when the uh, Zeppelin is flying by with Tombo on it. Oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah, and also by the end, when 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 his wife is like, "Yeah, take me to the hospital," and he's like, "Oh shit," I, I don't think he he doesn't say "Oh shit," but I think he says something while he's stumbling away. <laughs> yeah, most most of what he does is just like flourish his fucking uh, his fucking baking pans, like yeah. a boy. Yeah, and he and he's showing off. He's showing off. Like when he knows that someone's watching him, he's like, "Oof, gotta pump up these muscles." <laughs> uh, uh, if I recall, the only other men we see, or, or with speaking roles, are the um, the police officer and the guy at the hotel at the beginning, and they're both uh, like quite uh, standoffish to her and don't want anything with her. Do There's also the the guy at the clockwork and the yeah. uh, guy with the broom in the streets, but oh, those yeah. are very minor, very minor roles, yeah. I would guess it's sort of deliberate because it feels like like Kiki is uh, primarily about about um, women and, and the the characters he chooses are to show like different uh, different developmental stages or different uh, uh, balances of like traditional uh, femininity and like modernity, um, like the they're very deliberately chosen to be at these different stages of life. Um, yeah. yeah, you're right, because we get like Ursula, who's like a uh, slightly older than Kiki, living on her own, and then we get the uh, the fashion designer lady, who's kind of like a, a self-made businesswoman, and then of course uh, a Sono, who, who runs a bakery and is also pregnant, kind of mm -hmm. being like that final stage of being like a mother, a mother figure, and also a business owner, who's out, and then the grandmother. out doing stuff for herself. And then yeah, of course the grandmother, who like in a twilight years is still like kind and thinks of people and does her best when she can yeah i guess that's also in general this film represents a lot of miyazaki representing and thinking about different kinds of femininity the most interesting thing right off the bat uh the depictions of witches in this in this movie like the the witches are not old not ugly not like magical and uh, in some weird like forests or whatever but they're kind of just regular upbeat women yeah they're not they're not um they don't exist on like the fringes of society as you normally would see in a fantasy story right they're they're like symbols of of traditional community uh which i think is a really uh, interesting reappropriation of the the witch as like an archetype but um, also in a, in a very interesting way, if you consider uh, the person, her mother, right, yeah. with a chemistry set, not with like a not with like a cauldron and it bubbles and as she brews and throws in dead rats or some shit, but instead with a, like scientific looking uh, uh, chemical laboratory. Yeah, very much. And also uh, Kiki by the end flying with a modern like broom from like a street yeah. a uh, 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 swiper. Yeah, that was one of the biggest things in her development, I feel, that that little broom at the end. It's like a very nice aesthetic flourish that really shows mm. her, not just like a maturity, but also shows like a symbol of modernity in the way that yeah. she's come yeah. to accept this town and she's now riding on like a, a modern kind of broom. Because uh, I really think um, the way Kiki evolves throughout the film visually is, is very well done, where she starts out um, with her mother's big, huge broom, that's like oversized for her and she's got this massive bag on her shoulders she looks like a child playing dress up and then towards the end she's like way more free on like a smaller broom but like something that suits her far more yeah a good like mix of of the modern and the traditional i mean i yeah, think so, it's also yeah. it's also telling that the individual that miyazaki figures as being on the fringes of society as being um I don't want to use the word transgressive, but of ex existing on that sort of liminal space on the outside is is the artist, is Ursula, um, rather than the witch. 
Oh yeah, that's really interesting, right? You're right. Like Ursula's even living in the woods with like the, the, the crows around and all these signifiers related to witches. But then she's just a like upbeat, like almost like completely modern looking girl with like jeans and a tank top and she's like drawing modernist paintings. <laughs> yeah, it's a really strange inversion there. Um, yeah, I, th I don't know if Miz Miyazaki is exactly trying to say something with that, but it's almost like the uh, the self-made artist is more of a, a magical creature than the witch in this world. That like as a reflection of how we view artists or how uh, artists exist to kind of be transgressive people. It's almost like old stories of witches. They're weird people that have to live alone. I think the role that she has to play is, is as... Uh... In some stories, like the witch is is like this font of wisdom, this this guiding light for the character. So I think I think it's more of pointing her into that role as opposed to um, like the actual witches in the story um, is why she's coded that way. But like I was initially just thinking of it as something that was uh, an interesting inversion. I think. But to talk more about interesting inversions, the entire like plot of this movie is also one about kiki leaving her rural village to seek her fortune in a larger city um which is a quest more typical of male protagonists i find uh yeah but uh of course with miyazaki he always likes the idea of women taking uh, yeah. more active roles as a uh, as i previously mentioned when i was in the Nors norsica episode it felt like um it felt like that uh, Miyazaki has this view for women to be like more active in society and, like I said, leaders or like figures who can clearly make it on their own. But while still, he clearly shows the women definitely have a role as like mothers and they're still kind of traditional archetypes. Because as we see, Kiki has two mother figures in the film in her real mother, of course, and then Asono, who like is her adopted mother. And they both show like this strength and independence that women can have while still being part of like a family unit. And it's also quite fitting at the times because um, feminism took a while to take over in Japan. Like in the 1960s, there was the women's liberation movement, but it culturally really didn't take over until the late 70s and mid 80s, which is kind of the time from which um, um, uh, Kiki arises. Then, namely by the 1980s, like women were much more likely to go to college and to work outside the home. And shoujo manga started to become a thing which featured uh, powerful and independent like hero, uh, girl heroes. And Miyazaki also, like in his musings about female uh, Ghibli staff members, noted how diligent and dedicated and passionate they were and how they all came like from rural towns into the big city. Uh, all these kind of things coalesce into uh, a vision of the almost like the more emancipated Japanese women leaving behind like the traditional place and coming into the workforce and really carving out their own place and being in all sorts of social positions. This is what, what needs to be noted about all these women in this film, right? Motherhood is a thing, but then they're also like bossy family leaders or business owners or like just kind old ladies or young, like emancipated like girls <laughs> that are spoiled spoiled rotten or just weird artists living out in the woods those, those are all things that can be done that, that are done all positions that women now assume yeah i think it's important that um miyazaki chose I, I think that this this film is an expression of miyazaki's like love and empathy for all these people who are in this changing world and like trying to find their place like like you said it was it's it's at a point of great change for women and the at this point there would be thousands and thousands and thousands of women who like need to hear this that they are that all these these troubles that they're facing they're brand new for like even their friends and themselves and everyone around them um but they 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 have support they have friends they have people who will look out for them and Miyazaki wanted to show them that through this film in in the way that only Miyazaki can um and so it's very much an expression of his deepest empathy for the people who are in this changing world and don't know where they're going or, or, or what, what's, what they're aiming for. But um, Miyazaki shows them that there, there is a path and there are people who will help you along the way. But, there isn't, but the, the, at the same time, it's also about how 
you cannot let this expectation of of reality dictate how you uh, interact with with the world because there are going to be people who let you down. They, they they have this expectations of the world and that people will they, they 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 many people when they have expectations and then reality doesn't meet their expectations they it doesn't meet those expectations they fall into a slump or a depression or anything where they feel like that things will never be perfect and they'll never work out how they want it to and Miyazaki is very aware of this and he he also tells these people that um this will happen and you will be let down and you will be disappointed but you can pick yourself back up after these setbacks and these these times where things don't go your way um and that that's very important um because I, I also wanted to talk about how y you you, you talked about the ending and you, you you said you didn't really understand the 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 set piece at the end and i yeah i i think that's it's very the way that the way that it um the way that Miyazaki chooses uses sound in that in that that ending section is very important because when 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 Kiki is getting on that broom for the first time in in that in that ending sequence, all of the sound dissipates. There's no sound, none at all. It's just Kiki and the broom because the story it's not about anything else at that point in time. It's just about Kiki getting back on that broom. Everything else is drowned out. There's nothing else. But when Kiki has got on that broom and she's 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 trying to fly again and she's she's in the air, everyone's encouraging her. Like there's there's cheers, there's shouts, there's people like screaming, going, "Go, Kiki, go! You can fly!" Because in the end, if you don't take that step by yourself at the beginning, there is nothing that anyone else can do for you. But once you're once you're there, once you're in the sky, once you're flying, like there are so many people who can like support you and and tell you that you're going in the right direction and help you along the way and just cheer for you but if you don't take that first step and if you don't get out of that yourself like there's nothing that can be done really because you're you're, you're still going to be on the ground um but you you do need those friends like ursula who who tell you that things will be okay and that you'll have these these down moments but you will recover from them yeah, th this also reminds me of um, that they, in planning out the movie poster, and I know I kind of talk about the movie poster every episode, <laughs> uh, while planning out the movie poster, they uh, were trying to come up with a good phrase, and finally they decided on the phrase, I was down for a while, but now I'm feeling good, displayed like over the picture of, of Kiki slouching on the bakery like uh, uh, counter. So very, very... <laughs> fitting summary of, of, of these uh, points. Um, I think it's interesting to, uh, again, go a bit into how it differs from the original novel because it kind of highlights exactly these things you've been talking about. Because the first big difference is Ursula, which we already talked about. She wasn't, she had like, she didn't even have a name in the book. She didn't play a huge role. And Miyazaki really underlines her presence and influence and role. And the other major difference is that Miyazaki has said and expressed clearly that he wanted to darken the tone in the sense of how independence comes at the cost of loneliness and self-questioning that are just part of maturing. Yeah, well, I really feel that uh, that's why the blimp scene makes so much sense towards the end, because uh, it's some you can kind of view it as a, an unnecessary action bit at the end for like a Hollywood style ending, but... Really, I feel like it's uh, if this is the narrative of someone with a talent or an artist or something like that, if we're taking Kiki as a, a metaphor, then it's clearly like an inciting incident that happens. Because sometimes in real life that does happen, like Miyazaki himself multiple times might have been in a slump, but he's had work to do. He's just been given something, it's like he has to do this, and so it's a challenge that's right in front of him that he can't ignore. And that happens to plenty of artists or people with talent, where like even if they don't feel about doing it, or if they feel they can't do it, they will be forced into it due to like events out of their control. And this is just a more fantastical vision of this. This is interesting because being forced into it, like the blimp is going to take off and there's going to be stakes to it. Kind of like growing up, kind of like losing the safety of the past where no sudden incision or change could like disrupt your safety and calmness and your uh, position being well off. 
And this is interesting because Susan Napier talks about, in a comparison to Totoro, she talks about if Totoro is in some ways a movie about fear of death, then Kiki can be seen as relating to the fear of transition, as fear as a form of mourning for the loss of childhood. Yeah, that's definitely true in um, her parental figures, in the way that we see her leave her parents first giddy to go out into the world, but then she kind of regrets it, and then she meets Asona, who becomes her surrogate mother. And then um, she loses Gigi, who is kind of like a, a yeah. not maybe not a father figure, but he's still kind of like a, a presence of a safety blanket in her life. And then she loses contact with him, and she just leaves uh, Asona completely to go out into the woods. And then before the blimp crashes, crashes she's basically by herself. And then she sees... Uh, on TV, the blimp, and she has to do it all alone. And like we see, we get that scene of perfect silence of her um, in, a, in a in a crowded place, but it's a complete silence of her riding the broom again. And and I think that's quite powerful because while the loss of Gigi, in a sense, does amount to a mourning of the loss of childhood, because basically Gigi and, and what he was is lost, but he was always like this kind of immature specter this 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 i don't want to say like purely illusion but of course he represented something like kiki's immaturity and while she gains the ability to fly again not being able to talk to gigi reminds us of that which is lost in the process of maturing i guess yeah gigi also uh in a little flourish finds maturity in himself by becoming a father yeah so that's like an, an, a neat little thing when everyone grows up yeah, that's true. In the, in the in the credits, we see all kinds of stuff. We see Osono's baby. We see like the little ki kittens. We see Kiki being much more confident and engaged in the community. All these things, everyone grew. I think uh, I I just like to to go back to to Kiki's uh, slump just for a moment because yeah. uh, one one of the questions that we wrote down uh, in in as like things we probably should answer in this podcast was uh, why does Kiki lose the ability to fly? And I was just kind of thinking about that. And I think that's a really interesting question because the answer doesn't really matter because, and, and, and Miyazaki says this very explicitly, that because that having a reason for why you're, you're, you're in a slump, why you're depressed, why you're in that state doesn't help. It doesn't fix the problem. The problem is still there. Understanding it doesn't make it go away um, because these irrational potentially irrational feelings they you can't reason yourself out of them they are they are just a something that you will have to deal with and you won't be able to see them coming you won't be able to predict them um and they will happen you will feel burnt out you will feel like you're not good enough you will feel like things will not go the way that you want them to um but that doesn't that doesn't mean that you you can't fix it and and the way that you get out of them may be random it may be a friend it may be anything you you can't know that either um and and life's unpredictability is like a big thing in this movie as well because you you never know really what life will throw at you and you just kind of have to be prepared to deal with it um uh, yeah i think that's also very interesting because now thinking about it just trying to give a clear answer to why she loses the ability to fly is really hard because you could try and go the route of like seeing that it's a confluence of things like she gets uh, sick, she misses her invitation to the party, she was wet the last day, she's kind of in general alienated, not like boomingly successful, all these kind of things, but none of it is really why she loses the ability to fly. It just, it just happens at some point. It's just there. Yeah. Then. And, and, and she... Miyazaki explains this through through the animators who might uh be go i could do this yesterday but i can't do it today why why is why is my talent abandoning me why is my ability abandoning yeah. me like like I, I something that was so easy is now the hardest thing in the world unimaginably so and so this is very much a thing that artists especially but people in all walks of life will probably go through at some point where they feel like they, they can't do this thing that came so easily to them before. I guess that's what makes it magical, that it's elusive and unpredictable. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> I mean... But I guess yeah. the next fitting question is, how does she 
learn to fly again? How is she able to fly again? What what happens? What what makes her shift? Well, I mean, I think in a sense, um, like you just she stops trying to force it. I mean, uh, she takes a break. She gets herself some space from it. Um, she spends a lot of time with Ursula, and and I, I think that in a sense uh, inspires her at least. Uh, yeah. Looking at Ursula's painting, um, I think, uh, which is I've been just had it open in the other window, but like the the painting is just like of of how, I guess the way I describe it is Ursula being like entranced by the power of flight, and then. Um, because like we see the things that are are fixated on in the frame are are Kiki flying on the uh, the Pegasus, and then the crows flying, and then I don't know if this is like an ox or something or <laughs> whatever. Uh, but all this stuff flying in the in this night sky and the moon, and Ursula in the background is small and just watching uh, it with with her arms spread and just. I guess I guess what would be a, a sort of figure of exaltation, but like, I think I think it's a matter of of the both of them trading inspiration in this way that that gives Kiki back her power of flight. Um, that Kiki felt inspired by her conversation with Ursula, and Ursula was inspired to paint by by Kiki. Yeah, I agree. But again, it's also a, another confluence, right? We have multiple factors. We have. Kiki's taking a break. Kiki has a friend in Ursula who will listen, who will talk to her, who's inspired by Kiki. Kiki has the inspiration from the painting. Ursula also gives advice like just take a walk, just, you know, get get it out of your head for a moment. And then also the incision, the traumatic moment where Kiki has to fly again because Tombo is in danger. All these things kind of like yeah. flow together. Also, uh, just before Kiki flies again, we have a scene where she goes back to the uh, the old lady, and the old lady has like baked her a cake as a thank you, and Kiki kind of like gets that realization that oh yeah, people really care about the job I do, and it actually means something to other people instead of it just being a job. It's like a a, a way to like interact and connect with people. So there's also that element as part of the confluence, also. Well, it didn't matter much for the bratty girl. She didn't like the cake, uh, or whatever the casserole. It, it was a uh, herring, like herring, herring and pie. herring and something yeah. else. Sounds <laughs> disgusting. It really does. Herring and pumpkin. That was it. That's awful. <laughs> so that leaves us to, um, I guess, because we we had a list of questions, we we went through most of them, uh, but a big one still remains, namely not only. My, my one of the ones I wanted to discuss was, of course, the ending, the structural elements, and so on and so on. But also a big question, like lingers like a guillotine or haunts this movie in a sense, I think, which is, what does the blimp mean? And before we really get into this, I want to talk about the town. I want to talk about the designs of the town. Uh, I mean, it's pretty hard to to place where and when we are in the town. I think. Yeah. That's weird, isn't it? Like Miyazaki and, and, and studio went to visit some Swedish towns, for example, Stockholm, in order to like get inspired, draw some of the scenery. But also around the coastal areas, it's clearly Mediterranean. And then when it comes to cars and fashion, everything is completely out of time, out of space. Like we have 20s to 50s cars existing in the same space. We have fashion up to like the 70s, it feels like. Uh, down to like very old fashioned fashion we got all these like like this very old like uh wood wood based oven all these things like it is as if this place was kind of a condensed time space where, where, where lots of times of, of european history coincide with an, one notable lack and that was pointed out by one text uh, uh I, I read about um the um how Yao Miyazaki fantasy and history in Kiki's Delivery Service, where it is actually impossible for these things to coincide without uh, World War II. Uh, with World War II, that's the way around. That again, like in Totoro, we are kind of here presented with an alternate history, but also an alternate space. We need to be clear about this. Like, it's a no time, no place 
<laughs> in a sense that it, it excludes the presence of World War II, the the biggest and most depressing failure of modernity, we could say. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, we do in some senses escape to a different sort of place and time. But I think I think with the blimp, he's very deliberately calling back to the Hindenburg. Yes. Yes. Um, so the ghost so of I the think, Hindenburg is haunting this movie. I think, in a sense, while he he's um, nego negotiated an escape from the very worst symptoms of modernity, he still sorts of puts them in there in, in these sort of in this small. I mean, maybe not small, but in this uh, not quite so cataclysmic way. Um, but this is how I really made sense of the ending of the movie. And for me, this really put into perspective Miyazaki's entire filmography. Because while at the same time, and you pointed it out perfectly, we have this idealized past, which kind of represents an escape. Um, we also have themes in Kiki of losing touch with the past, of moving on from like all the traditions into a more modern style. The witch now wears a red tie and l works in the city as an entrepreneurial business. We have a general uh, like city society and urban society representing a disconnect or rift with the traditional society. We have all these images of like um, <laughs> um, time moving on we have all these callbacks to older times, like, for example, the old lady um, tr then using the old oven again because it's so much nicer to use the old oven and so on and so on. And we got these two images of, like, the tradition and the magical and the modernity and the technological both represented through, through flight. On the one hand, flight on the broom flight the witch's flight the magical flight the one that is uh, based on all these elusive properties of talent and heritage and it is it is in your blood kiki it is something inherited this is pointed out in the film versus the technological one the the dream of like the luxury flight vehicle that is the blimp and of course since flight is so important for miyazaki's entire filmography it is quite significant that we see the the miyazaki struggle with the idealized past that is being lost. Like, for example, we see the idealized past, for example, in Totoro, but also the promises of the ideal future that can't ever be reached, like in Castle in the Sky, when the castle ultimately has to float away. We see that embodied in both of these elements, in, in the witches and the blimp. The I, think, blimp I, think, yeah. I think more so in this film, it's really crucial because we have uh, magic specifically tied to art. Um, and... Um, checking my timeline. This is like at the very beginning of when we start seeing uh digital effects in anime, um, specifically. So, so this is becoming sort of a a looming threat on the horizon to people like Miyazaki, who are very much in line with the traditional uh drawings, and you know. In, in 2D animation as opposed to, to beginning to incorporate digital drawing, digital effects, these stuff that are going to uh, come into play in a big way in the future. That is also pretty interesting, yeah, that, that, that from the like meta perspective where in many Miyazaki films we can equate flight at least to some extent with the art of animation, yeah, that makes sense. It, it, yeah, more so in this film than others, I think. I think he very uh, also, deliberately... Uh, Makes like that... we had in Nausicaa, where we have the um, the big planes that are all clunky and lacking maneuverability, kind of be part of the what the bad guys use. Uh, in this, like we have Tombo's little self-built plane that's like all by his own talent and work, and that's like as a good seen as a good thing. But then this big, huge blimp is kind of a an eyesore and ends up uh, destroying parts of the town. But but we can't forget that the blimp was a hope, like it was for all the airship travel, it was a gigantic promise of future luxury fl a flight, of affordability, of like gentle flying because of like its stability in the air due to like the gases uh, and so on. Like back then when the Hindenburg was around, it was a luxury thing. This thing 
has su- has left such a traumatic memory on like the entire history of modernity and it killed the blimp afterwards it wasn't marketable anymore it killed the blimp the only blimps today are a rarity and in between there wasn't much use of them at all because the hindenburg has kind of scarred this fantasy of the future in which we have the luxury uh, uh blimps as flight in this sense it's kind of a sad eulogy f- to the dreams and meta narratives of modernity as such uh, yeah, i don't yeah, know if definitely. i necessarily see it that way to me well, it would make more sense of it's um again this flying thing it's almost like yeah, the the flying and the luxury and convenience of it but without any kind of the uh the the self-will that miyazaki sees in flying where all of his characters who, who fly like nasuka who has like her own just small um pair of like wings almost they're like this little thing that just glides on the air or in castle in the sky it's like a little self-run ship that the the pirates use it's like all this kind of people really putting effort into flying and people really putting their hearts into flying which miyazaki relates to and so people who just want a comfy trip through the air end up getting a, a crashed blimp because they didn't really earn it in a sense maybe that maybe that's a bit yeah. too harsh uh, of a I reading mean, uh, I think I don't even disagree. I think it there. fits. Yeah, but I think also what, with what Nyard was saying was that um, this is this is uh, like the promise of the future that is that is falling to pieces here. But at the same time, I think in response to that, what we're seeing is that we can't go back to that traditional past, um, and this is why Kiki ends up using the the push broom as opposed to the traditional witch's broom like the 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 past is is gone um is lost in a sense um it's not something if, you can yeah. quite return to but at the same time the future is going to bring all these problems with it yeah kiki flying in a sense is a wish for a negotiation between modernity and tradition that works out i think i th- i think personally there's also some somewhat nostalgic sadness in the fact that only in a fantasy movie that is kind of out of time can we have this magical negotiation that fixes the problem of modernity with this magic i i think in some sense miyazaki is saying like the flight that we put effort in we're like passionately behind the flight and you are from a talent and artistic and magical perspective into the flight is a way out and that art is in the sense as analogous to flight a negotiation where you can find like that which is lost which has lost which was lost when the dreams of modernity have been crushed but in a sense there's an image of this longing and never quite reaching of the future that is founded upon an alternative past that really is pervasive throughout all of Miyazaki's filmography something something right. irredeemable has happened which caused the rift and important things were lost. And the castle in the sky has to float away. And the Totoros exist only in a space out of time. The blimp failed and only magic can fix this, right? This this longing for this solution where there can be an actual negotiation, an actual synthesis. Yeah, I think I think the sentiment that you're talking about is pretty bluntly, I think, spelled out by Ursula when she's talking to Kiki yeah. and she's talking about what what made her think that she could paint Kiki um, is I think, I think um, if I remember correctly, what she's saying is that when she saw Kiki with a sad face, she thought that's it. Um, And that this is sort of the, the, the motivation for her paintings with, with that, that exalt in the glory of flight, but the, the motivation for it is a girl with a sad face. Damn. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> I think that that sort of fits in this narrative. Um, That's Mono Navara as fuck. Yeah, it is. I, I think we're on a roll. We're mentioning this every single episode. It's amazing. We can't escape Mono It's Nawara. almost like it's it's the one of the most central themes to like all Japanese works. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> almost. Almost like they have a term for it. Yeah, and we use it constantly. <laughs> and I think. Since we now like this pointer, honestly, is 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 I was something I'm looking forward to like talking about when we talk about Poco Rosso in I think two episodes, because um, Poco Rosso really is is without wanting to take too much ahead, um, 
is really Miyazaki dealing much more explicitly with like his reaction to this realization that the negotiation there will almost inevitably fail in some sense. His more cynical face, I would say. <laughs> Which is why it's a, one of my favorite Miyazaki films. <laughs> all right, I annihilated my notes. Um, do, we have, do we have loose ends? Because all questions have been answered. Um, I was going to say, I, I did find the... Um, I kind of brought it up a little bit before, but I found the parental relationships uh, in this movie to be pretty interesting, the way that we have... Um, Kiki's mother and father be almost a, a reflection of how her and Tombo are towards the end of the film. So there's always kind of like a link to like family tradition there in the way that um, we learn that Kiki's mother, like her, left home and came to the town where she now lives and she never went back home as we see because she stayed and had Kiki. And in the way that we see Kiki make a home out of this new town with Tombo. Also, maybe I'm, I'm seeing a little bit too much, but like Tombo definitely is resembles her dad a bit in the way that he's kind of this clumsy uh nerdy guy that's kind of like all miyazaki guys yeah, that it's, are it's all, to be it's, sympathetic, all though. it's all miyazaki men to be fair he definitely yeah. has an archetype that's strangely similar to himself um yeah but yeah i noticed i mean that quite the, a bit. The, the, the men are usually less of a dick than than he is mm, that's <laughs> true he's an asshole mm. <laughs> Yeah. Also, clearly, you know, the, the way they resemble having a, a clear skill in the way that um, Tombo is, you know, good with planes. And then also we kind of see um, Asano's husband, uh, even though he didn't say much, we see he's very, like, proficient with his bakery skills, kind of spinning the pallets on his hands. He's Even though it's, like, normal work, he takes a lot of pride in it. And that's yeah. kind of like a, his masculine role. He's, like, kind of perfect masculine role right there, a man who, like, takes great pride in a in a simple craft but you know puts all of his heart into it i think potentially uh, a lot of the male characters are miyazaki projecting him himself from his youth before he perhaps became a little bit more cynical and uh less and a bit more um world weary i guess so oh, yeah he talks about that on occasion, I think, in Starting Point and in Miyazaki World, there's some quotes highlighting how Miyazaki very often draws upon himself as a, as a kid. Like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, if Miyazaki projected himself entirely on Tombo, because Tombo is um, very similar to uh, Pazu from Castle in the Sky, and Miyazaki mm. already said that Pazu was a definite reflection of his younger self. And so I could definitely see that uh, a lot of the young characters in Miyazaki's films are representations of his younger self before he became uh, a little bit more world-weary, as I said before. Yeah, uh, Tombo is also basically uh, Jean from Nadia because uh, Miyazaki also created him. He gave the uh, like original ideas to Anno. So uh, that uh, exact archetype carries on then. And then also kind of a... Uh, uh, the main guy in um, As the Wind Rises is almost like the grown-up version of that where he's literally designing oh, yeah. planes. Yeah. Like, that's fully become his job. He's fully realized that. Which is also uh, another film where, like, flight clearly represents the failures of modernity. Yeah. I guess we're going to talk about this in, like, two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when we get around to that. I do find it interesting, though, that As the Wind Rises is the only actual wartime movie he's made like movie actually set in the wartime as opposed yeah, to being around yeah. it or not during having it the wartime yeah uh yeah porco rosso is slightly before wartime we see the rest yeah of that's Italian that's that's the very Earth, specific yeah. thing about porco but i guess we'll, we'll talk about that when we get onto it not to yeah. to spoil anything about it now oh yeah one last thing i uh still a few more like aesthetic flourishes that uh that i really liked uh yeah. I, I already mentioned the uh kiki's broom changing throughout the film we also notice like her flying patterns mature because like in the first opening scene we see that um kiki uh, is very poor at flying actually and she's banging into the trees and even her neighbors uh, are talking about how she's always banging into the trees and letting the bells off and then we see casually you know she becomes way more confident at it and then of course in the final scene uh where she's on the new broom she's she's barely controlling herself almost like showing that talent having to come back in small steps like it's not a sudden burst of her being great again she has to kind of like relearn baby steps 
but still, you know, the talent is there. She's always going to, like, have that ability to fly. Yeah. And also then, at the end, uh, another great moment, which is just, like, the cutest thing that happens in the film, is that Kiki uh, sees a little girl who's, like, five years old, dressed up as her, oh, walking yeah. by. Which is great, because we see Kiki in earlier scenes, like, looking at nice shoes and seeing girls who are all fashionable at her age and you know and she's always says she's disappointed in like the black shift she has to wear that was her mother's but now she like is the trendsetter she's fully accepted into this town where like people want to be like her so that's like a really nice moment there all right then that's it from the nausicaa's delivery service look forward to the next cast when we will be returning to takahara with only yesterday until then, if you want to support us and help us upgrade our microphones to finally sound decent, you can pledge us a few bucks on Patreon. That is patreon.com slash with a double A. But also we have a Discord server. If you want to reach out to us or talk to us, the Discord server is a Patreon area, but also a public one for everyone to join. So find the link in the video description or... Well, you're going to have to check out the video description. I can't link you anything in an MP3 file. Uh, all right. <laughs> Enough shilling. Uh, I wish you a pleasant day and goodbye. Bye. Bye. Bye.